Welcome back, everyone. This is our second uh, lecture that is focused on describing sample data. So how do we describe or summarize one variable at a time? So uni using univariate descriptive statistics. In our previous lecture, we went over the three major measures of central tendency or location. So you may recall the mode, the median, and the mean. And each one of those had its specific advantages for different types of variables to give us an idea of sort of what the typical response was, the average response, the most common response for a particular variable. But that's only one aspect of describing that particular variable. We want to know the most common or sort of the average point, but we also want to know a second characteristic about any variable. We want to know how spread out the variety of, of responses that are given for any particular variable. And that's what we're going to focus on in this lecture. And this is step two, variability and dispersion. So similar to what we saw with our last lecture, we're going to introduce the concept of variability and dispersion and then go through um, various statistics that we can use in order to illustrate um, this particular concept. The reading that goes along with this lecture is chapter three and specifically the pages 69 through 81 of your textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. We start with a little bit of a review that we saw from our last lecture, but I'm a big, a big proponent of repetition, especially when it comes to math and things of that nature. Examples and practice seem to make finally get the stuff to sink in. So we had talked about if we're trying to summarize or describe one variable, so in a univariate sense, there are three aspects. So we started off with our last lecture about looking at central tendency and location, the most common value, the average value, now we're going to move on to variability and dispersion. We want to know how different or diverse the responses happen to be. Um, how spread out are the values? So just like we saw with our last lecture, it, a lot of the choice of your statistical approach to sort of summarizing the variability or dispersion of a variable depends upon those levels of measurement. Is my variable at the nominal, the ordinal, or the interval ratio level of measurement? So let's dive into it recognize this set of data from our prior lecture. Um, so we're going to use the same um, little data set to walk through and illustrate variability and dispersion, uh, just like we did with measures of central tendency. So you see in this data set, we have four different variables. We have that original X variable, which is number of prior arrests. Um, and this is at that interval or ratio level of measurement. We then have the current offense variable, that Y variable, that is at that nominal level of, of measurement. And then Z and W are similar to X and Y. They just have some unique twist to them. So let's go ahead and use some of these variables to start talking about variability and dispersion. So we start with frequency breakdown using a pie chart. Now, this isn't really what I would call pure um, high level statistics, but with nominal variables particularly, and often with nominal and ordinal level variables, those qualitative variables, we need to have some way to capture the amount of variability or dispersion. However, because with nominal and ordinal level variables, the numbers are sort of arbitrarily chosen to represent some category, using some sort of mathematical way to capture the amount of variability across the responses is practically impossible. So, but I don't want to overlook it. So we start here with sort of a pseudo statistical approach if you're working with a nominal or an ordinal variable. And most of you are probably somewhat familiar with a pie chart. And a pie chart is just a graphical display that looks like a, a you know, a circle that is cut up into, you know, pizza slices or pie um, uh, slices. And each slice represents the number or percentage of times that a particular response occurs. So this is good when you're working with nominal or ordinal level data and you still want to convey the amount of, of dispersion or the differences or the variability in that particular variable. So for this one, we used variable Y. And you may recall variable Y was current offense, where one, uh, the category one represented the violent offense and, then, and so forth. And so what we see in this pie chart, if you look at sort of the color-coded labels, we can see that the most frequently occurring value was the blue, and the blue corresponded to violent, and that's why we see that it takes up half of the pie. 
And then each one of our other types of, of offenses only occurred once. And so they each have, you know, their equal slices on the left hand side. Now, one of the big disadvantages of this is, as you can see, the full first bullet point says this doesn't provide a single summary statistic. So we're sort of already in violation of what we're trying to do with statistics, which is to provide single numbers. But it's still a way to illustrate. And it's pretty. I mean, the simple thing is oftentimes, depending upon if you're putting something into a report or you're doing a presentation at a conference, when you can sort of see a pie chart, people get an idea of how diverse the responses are, and also they can kind of tell what the most common and least common ones were. So they get a little bit of, of both. Um, and so we've got that one. Now, I don't recommend using a pie chart breakdown for quantitative variables because with quantitative variables, you usually have a lot more individual number values. So say we're measuring age of a group of a thousand people you would have a bunch of tiny little slices all the way around there and it gets just kind of ugly and overwhelming. But it does work nicely for qualitative variables when you only have three, four, five, six categories or something like that. Now we're gonna move on to the more sophisticated measures of variability and dispersion. And all of these ones going forward are going to be focused more on interval and ratio level variables. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. So the first of the quote unquote pure statistics, um, sophisticated measures of variability and dispersion is what is known as the range. And the range, if I say, what were the range of values in some variable? Most of us have no problem. You'll say, oh, it ranged from this value to that value. That's fine, but remember, in statistics, the word range represents a statistic. And by definition, the range becomes a single number. How do we compute that single number? We measure the distance between the maximum and the minimum values. So you take the highest value observed for a particular variable and then subtract the lowest value observed. And you'll notice looking at the chart over on the right, I've crossed out variables y and w. Why did I do, why did I do that? Well, because you may recall from when we set up these variables, Y and W were qualitative variables. When we get into talking about the range, and then on the coming slides, we're gonna talk about variance and standard deviation. These types of measures of variability must have quantitative level variables. So we're only gonna focus on variables X and Z for the rest of this lecture. So that's why I have those crossed out. So let's take a quick look at how we would compute the range for both variable X and variable Z. Well, variable X, what we have to do is find what was the, the maximum or highest value observed. And as we look through that list of observations, we see that it was eight. And then we have to also find the minimum, the lowest value observed. And we look through that list and find that it's three. So in order to compute the range, it's eight minus three. And the range for variable X equals five. It's, that's all there is to it. Same idea for variable Z. We go in there and we have to find the highest value, 28, and then subtract the lowest value, three. And so 28 minus three, and we get a range of 25 for variable Z. So these are a good starting point. The range is a good starting point for getting sort of a, a brief look at how, you know, the amount of variety or dispersion you're seeing for your particular variable. Um, and it's good because it does, in fact, provide a single number. So clearly, by looking at variable X and variable Z, looking at those range values, we can automatically tell there's a lot more variability in variable Z. It has a much higher range, right? But remember, because this is a somewhat of a crude measure, the range, it only focuses on the highest value and the lowest value. It ignores everything else. We sort of, one of the disadvantages is we think of it as being somewhat of a crude and simplistic measure, right? It only cares about the highest and the lowest. It ignores all the other values in the data. And because it only focuses on the highest and lowest values, it can be heavily influenced by even a single outlier. And that's exactly what we see when we compare the range for variable X compared to the range for variable Z. Variable Z, we introduced one single outlier, that value of 28. And you can see the drastic impact it had on the range. You know, the range for variable Z is five times larger than the range for variable X. So that's gonna be one of the major shortcomings of the range. So as we move forward, 
we need to come up with some slightly more sophisticated measures of variability and dispersion that sort of get past the, this, the disadvantages that the range has. We want values that take into account all the data and then maybe a little bit more robust as far as what they're um, telling us about variability and dispersion. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. So you'll notice here, I don't just have A, B, now I have C and D combined. Because the reason for that is because the, our next two variability statistics, variance and standard deviation, you can't really talk about one without talking about the other because they do go hand in hand with one another. Um, and so it makes it kind of nice that we can kind of combine them together. But please understand, they are two different statistics. The variance is one measure of variability. The standard deviation is another measure of variability. And though they're closely related, we want to also sort of appreciate them for, for what they contribute um, statistically. So both the variance and the standard deviation, if we wanted a general definition, we might define them as saying they represent the average amount by which observed values deviate from the mean. So as I mentioned last lecture, when we talked about measures of central tendency, one of the things that I talked about the importance and the advantages of the mean is that it's used in a lot of other statistical formulas. And sure enough, we see that the mean coming back already in order to compute and understand variance and standard deviation. So their sort of representation of how di diverse or, va or variable the values are for a particular variable are all centered around that mean as our starting point. All right, so computing both the variance and the standard deviation. Here you'll see on this slide I have two formulas. And these formulas, for some of you, you may go, okay, I can figure that out. Give me the data and I'll compute it. Um, others, and don't be upset if or worried if you see this, some of you may look at those formulas and go, oh my goodness, I have no idea where to start. Don't worry about it. As you will see in the next couple slides, we're going to take these formulas and break them down step by step. So whether you become comfortable with interpreting and understanding one of these formulas in the summation notation format that you see right here, great. Um, but also we're going to show how you can break it down into five or six steps and you can kind of think about going about those and hopefully it'll give you two ways to approach computing the variance in the standard deviation. But also by going through that step-by-step -step approach, you can see how we can sort of deconstruct um, one of these formulas that's in summation notation. So let's do a couple more comments before we actually get into the actual math of it. Let's look at that variance formula first. So you may recall from an earlier lecture that we use symbols to represent sample statistics. And since this is a statistics course where we're focusing primarily on describing and using sample data, both for descriptive statistics, as well as later for inferential statistics, we're gonna be using those sample symbols. And so the symbol for variance is S squared. So that's what that's all that means, that S squared stands for variance. How do we compute it? Well, in the numerator of that equation, you see a nice little summation notation formula. And it says we sum up, and we look in the parentheses, you take each x value and you subtract the mean from that x value. Once you get those answers, you square each one of those. And then finally, you sum up what we're going to be calling the sum of squared deviations from the mean to get your answer for the top portion of that formula or the numerator. Finally, you will divide by n minus 1. And remember, n simply stands for the sample size. So we're going to see that in a step-by-step -step basis, how we go through it. When we look at the standard deviation, look at the, the symbol for standard deviation. It is simply an S. So if variance is S squared and standard deviation is S, well, how do we compute S from S squared? All that we need to do is take the square root. So you'll notice that the formula for standard deviation looks exactly like the variance formula, except for it's all underneath that square root symbol. So we'll show how we make sure we go through and walk through that. The final thing that I'm gonna say about the formulas on this particular slide is both of these are what we would call the unbiased or the adjusted formulas for variance and standard deviation. 
And we'll use these terms a little bit later in the course. But once again, these are referred to as oftentimes as the unbiased or the adjusted formulas for variance and standard deviation. Now, why are they quote unquote unbiased or adjusted? Well, the raw formulas for variance and standard deviation tend to be a little bit off if we're trying to use those formulas for sample data. You know, back way back when, when statistics and people were starting to compute numbers and do things like means and variance and standard deviation, oftentimes people started off with, well, here's my data set, so I'm gonna treat it as if it's the population, and these formulas were created. Well, when we started thinking about inferential statistics and using small segments of the population, a sample, to make or draw conclusions about the larger population, we realized that some of the formulas were a little bit, you know, it tended to either underestimate or overestimate certain values. So an adjustment was made. And the only adjustment that these quote unquote unbiased or adjusted formulas have is in the denominator of the formula, that N minus one. If you Google it or look in a textbook at what we would call the population formulas or the raw formulas for variance and standard deviation, they would look a lot like these except for one thing. The denominator, the bottom part of the formula, would simply have n instead of n minus 1. And it seems like a minor adjustment to simply say, okay, let's fix the formula by dividing by n minus 1. But that's all it really takes. And as we'll talk more in this class, and hopefully your mind will start to see it when we start to talk about the importance of samples and sample size, n minus 1, if you have a very large sample, doesn't make much difference to your denominator, right? If my sample size is 1,000, and then I subtract 1, well, instead of dividing by 1,000, I'm subtract, or excuse me, I'm dividing by 999. That doesn't make a very big difference. But what if your sample size is 4, right? And then now, 4 minus 1, dropping it down to 3, that can have a much bigger influence on what your overall answer will be. So I don't want to go to, into too much detail about that right now, but I just want you to understand in case you come across through other resources, if you say, why do these formulas look slightly different than other ones I see? It's because of this idea that there's what we call the population or raw formulas, which we will not work with in this class. And then there are the sample or the adjusted or the unbiased formulas. Those are the ones that you see here. Those are the ones that we will work with in this class. So let's go ahead and put them to use. Okay, so when we think about the variance in the standard deviation, first of all, why, what's good and bad about them? Well, the first advantage, similar to the mean, the variance in standard deviation are what we call the gold standards for measures of variability when we're working with those interval ratio level variables, those quantitative variables. Um, similar to the mean, we're gonna see them used in a lot of other statistical formulas and statistical tests that will be seen as we progress through the course. So they are sort of our go-to. Um, number two is similar to what the mean did with central tendency, both the variance and the standard deviation utilize all of the values in the data. So they're very democratic. Everyone gets to contribute. Um, whether you're an outlier, whether you're right in the middle, whatever it is, every single value in the data contributes. Um, another part is when we finally get to computing the standard deviation, the standard deviation is quote unquote in the units of the variable. So when we try to interpret the number, the statistic that we'll get, we can interpret it in a pretty easy way. So if I'm measuring number of prior arrests, then when we get to interpreting the standard deviation, you'll notice we will talk about it in number of prior arrests. If I was measuring age, and th that was my variable, and then I computed the standard deviation for an age variable, and it was in years, then when I interpret it, I could say that it represent the standard deviation measures years, um, the average distance in years that people deviate from the mean. So that becomes an important thing, and you'll see that at the end of this lecture when we get to the interpretation. The final big advantage of these ones is that they have a perfect application to what we, be, what we will be moving into within the next week or two, which is the, the Z distribution, the standardized normal curve. And that Z distribution is gonna be a really cool thing and it's sort of our, our bridge into inferential statistics. Um, and we will see that the, using, the use of the standard deviation comes right back into play when we get to that standardized normal curve. 
So don't worry about that one too much right now, but just kind of put that in the back of your brain that will mention the connection between standard deviations and the standardized normal curve when we get to it. Now, the disadvantages of variance and standard deviation is one is the variance, and you'll see in the next couple slides why we even compute the variance, but the variance when we compute it is in squared units. You may recall on the formula from the previous page, the formula for variance was S squared, right? It, we're gonna be squaring things. So because the variance in and of itself is in squared units, it's hard to interpret um, and, and apply back to our actual original data. Um, so that you'll see that's why we have the standard deviation. You'll see where those go. And then finally, both of these are not um, measures of variability that you would wanna use for those qualitative level variables. Um, and that's why we started off with like the pie chart and frequencies um, at the beginning of this lecture. All right, so let's continue on with computing the variance and standard deviation. On this slide, we have quite a bit going on, but hopefully I try to condense everything that I could into one slide to sort of break down those formulas that we saw a couple slides ago. Okay. So let's think about how we're gonna go doing this. So for on this page, we're gonna look at how do I compute both the variance and the standard deviation for variable X. So, and if you want to, you can always go back a couple slides, take a look at the original formulas that I had in summation notation, maybe even write them down on a piece of paper as we walk through these steps. These steps in the left-hand box are pretty much just breaking down those formulas step by step. Over in the right-hand box, we have our I column, one, two, three, four, five, six. We have our values of X that we observed, eight, six, four, five, three, four. And then the other two columns are gonna be pieces of how we go about solving those formulas that we saw a couple slides ago. So when we think about the formula, we'll start with the variance. When we saw that variance formula, one of the things that was in that formula was the mean. So we need to compute the mean before we can even start working with that formula. So step one is we need to calculate the mean for our variable. So you may recall, in order to do that, we sum up or add up all the values of the observation. So eight plus six plus four plus five plus three plus four. We add those up, we get a total of 30. That is our sum of X values. Then we divide by the number of observations or the sample size, which is six, and we get a mean of five. Okay, now that we have that mean, we can insert it into that portion of the formula where you may recall we're in the numerator, the top part of the formula, it said the sum of, and then in parentheses, we had X minus X bar, otherwise known as X minus the mean. Now we have to do this for each person in the data set. So that is what step two is, compute each deviation from the mean. If we look over to our table on the right-hand side, the third column over is what we're doing there. It's X minus X bar. So for person number one, their value is eight. We then subtract the mean. So X minus X bar is eight minus five. We get an answer, three. We move on to person two, six minus five, we get a one. Next person, four minus five, we get a negative one, and so forth. So in that third column over there on that right-hand chart, you can see that we have computed what are known as the deviations from the mean for each case in the data set. So we have three, a one, a negative one, a zero, a negative two, and a negative one. All right. So a lot of people would say, well, if the variance and standard deviation are supposed to measure the average amount by which people or values deviate from the mean, why don't we just compute the deviations from the mean as we did in step two, and then figure out the mean of those deviations? Logically, that would make sense. However, there's a mathematical problem, and actually it's a mathematical fact, and it's a good way to check yourself if you're asked to compute the variance or standard deviation by hand. If you look at that third column where we were computing the deviations from the mean, the X minus X bar, look at what they total to. And that total down at the bottom says zero. 
That is a mathematical fact that if you're doing your math correctly, that will always happen. The sum of deviations about the mean will always equal zero because the mean is the mathematical balance point for data. So once again, there's a mathematical fact. The sum of deviations about the mean will always equal zero. And that's what we see illustrated here. If we add up all those deviations from the mean in that third column, we go three plus one gives us four. Four plus a negative one drops us back down to three. Plus zero, no change, we're still at three. Plus a negative two, that drops us down to positive one. And then finally, plus another, plus a negative one. So one minus one gives us zero. So we zero is um, mathematically problematic, right? If I want to uh, zero divided by anything equals zero, right? And then conversely, if I put zero in the denominator of a division formula, anything divided by zero is unsolvable. So zero doesn't work nice in the realm of math. So how do we get around that problem yet still try to figure out a measurement of variability or dispersion? Aha, this is where those whole squared units things come back into play. And this is sort of in a nutshell, this is the importance of the role that the variance plays. So because you may recall from prior math courses, even if you square negative values, the negative signs disappear, right? All squared values will be positive. So that's why we have step three. Step three says square each deviation value. And this, thinking back to the formula, this is where we now went outside the parentheses and added that exponent. So it's x minus x bar squared. So what we do here, if we look at the far right um, column in our right-hand chart, where it says x minus x bar squared, this is step three, where we are squaring each deviation value. So we take three squared, we get a nine. One squared, we get a one. Negative one squared, we get a one. Zero squared is zero. Negative two squared, we get a positive four. Negative one squared, we get a positive one. So we've gotten rid of that, the negative problem that we had previously that was leading to adding to zero. So now what we do in step four, and thinking back to our formula, in that numerator of that variance formula, we had that summation sign up there, right? So that was telling us we needed to sum or add up all the squared deviations. Now this, it gives us what is known as the sum of squared deviations. Sometimes it's shortened to be called the sum of squares. Other times it is simply denoted by a capital S, capital S, so SS, and that's what we're using here. So various names. So in step four, we are summing up the square deviations, and that's what we see also in the far right column of our right-hand chart. So we have nine plus one gives us 10, plus one gives us 11, plus zero, we're still at 11, plus four gives us 15, and finally plus one more, gives us 16. So you'll notice down in that total, it says SS equals 16. This value of 16 is what is known as our sum of squares or sum of square deviations. And this is a mathematical term that you're gonna be hearing quite a bit as we get progressed throughout this class. And once we get past computing it by hand with a few examples here, we're not going to be doing much of sort of computing the sum of squares or even really computing the variance and standard deviation by hand once we get past the next couple weeks of this class. But we want to practice with it right now because these terms, variance, standard deviation, sum of squares, are things that we're going to see and that we'll be asking SPSS and our computer to produce for us. And we should at least have an understanding of what they're, what they're all about. Um, so that's why we're practicing them right now. So we, now once we have step four and we have that sum of square deviations, which is 16, the final thing we need to do in order to compute the variance is divide by n minus one. That was the bottom of that original formula. So in step five, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the sum of square deviations, that SS value, 16, and we're gonna divide by n minus one. Well, n was six, six minus one gives us five, 16 divided by 5 gives us 3.2. 
So there we have it. Our variance for the variable x is 3.2. And we think we're done, but we can't really interpret that very well. Remember from the previous slide, the problem with the variance is that 3.2 is in squared units. And since variable x was measuring the number of prior arrests, 3.2 represents squared arrests. And that doesn't make sense, right? There's no such thing as a squared arrest. So we need to fix it. We need to get this value back into the original units that we started with. And in order to do that, we compute the standard deviation. And it's as simple as taking the square root of the variance. So finally, in step six, we compute the standard deviation by taking the square root of the variance. So we notice we have that 3.2 under the nice little square root house. The square root of 3.2 gives us 1.79. So now we know that for variable x, the standard deviation is 1.79. Well, how am I supposed to work with that? That's what we're gonna move on to the next slide with is how do we interpret that value of 1.79 now that we have it? So let's take a look at that. So what we have here on this slide are sort of two general ways that, that the interpretation of the standard deviation is often used in, stati uh, in stati ah, statistical literature. I'm having a hard time talking right now. Um, so when we think about how we compute it, one thing that people often say is when we compute the standard deviation, you can use it for comparative purposes, right? If one variable has a higher standard deviation than another variable, you can simply say that that variable has more variability than the other um, variable. That's it. I mean, you can do it sort of in a comparison thing, but other times we want to sort of put it into like applying it to the actual single variable. So on this slide, what you see in purple, um, that purple language that's sort of italicized is what I typically call canned statistical language. You're going to hear me use that a lot as we go forward in this class. Um, what nice thing about statistics is you don't have to, don't try to be too fancy in how you interpret or explain things. Usually there's only a couple ways to summarize your findings or interpret a particular statistical test or an outcome. So don't be afraid of thinking like, well, that's how everyone else interprets it. I should do something different. No, you shouldn't. Keep it simple. Um, so when I talk about what I call canned language, make note of these things. Because if you're ever asked to interpret it, all you do is you take that canned language and then insert in the values and the names of the variables and the units of those variables that you're working with. So let's start with the first sort of canned interpretation of the standard deviation. The average amount by which observed values deviate from the mean. Okay, that's what we started with a couple slides ago. So how do I actually put that into place with my variable? And we'll focus on the standard deviation because that is in the original units of the variable. So using that, sa that same purple language, average amount by which, et cetera, and applying it to my prior arrest variable, I have there in black below it in quotes, on average, individuals tend to deviate from the mean number of prior arrests by approximately 1.79 prior arrests. And that's typically all you would say, and you would leave it at that. That is my standard deviation, and then move on. And you'll notice I've incorporated a lot of the information from that purple um, language. The average amount, on average. Tend to deviate, deviate from the mean. Then I insert the mean number of prior arrests, right? I'm giving the name of my variable by approximately, and then I give the value that I computed of the standard deviation, 1.79. And then finally, I remind my reader the units that my variable was being measured in, which is prior arrests. Another way that we often see the standard deviation used as far as interpretation purposes is at the bottom half of this slide. So you'll notice here, here's more canned language that we can work with. The purple language says, approximately two thirds of all observations will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. Okay, so you may be looking at that and go like, where'd that come from? That just came out of left field. And why do you have two thirds? And how did you compute that? Don't worry about that right now. This, the language, this purple language down at the bottom, this will make more sense once we get to the Z distribution or the standardized normal curve. You may recall from a couple slides back, 
I said one of the advantages of working with variance and standard deviation is that they directly link to that standardized normal curve, the Z distribution. Once we start working with that distribution and talking about something called the area under the curve, this whole idea of two thirds of all observations will come back to you. And you'll go, oh, that's where he, was, that's where he got that number from. That's where it came from. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to you know, pick which order I present things sometimes, but for right now, just trust me, roll with me, make a note of it, and then you'll see it sort of come full circle when we get to that in a couple weeks. Okay, so let's apply this to our prior rest variable. So approximately two thirds of all observations will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. Well, how do I do that with my variable? Well, let's break that down within one standard deviation of the mean. Okay, so what that's telling me is I need to start with the mean. And I go, okay, what was the mean for that variable? The mean was five, right? The mean for our variable X was five. Then in that purple language, it also says observations will fall within one standard deviation. Okay, what does he mean by one standard deviation? Well, what was your value of the standard deviation? Your de standard deviation value was 1.79 prior arrest. So that is one standard deviation. 1.79 is the raw value in the actual units of one standard deviation. So what I need to do, if approximately two thirds will fall within one standard deviation of the mean, I need to figure out a range of values. I need to figure out what is the mean minus one standard deviation, as well as what is the mean plus one standard deviation. That will give me this range of values that approximately two thirds of all observations will fall within. So if now let's look down, before we even read it, look down at that black language in quotes at the very bottom of the slide. If I take our mean of five, and then I subtract one standard deviation, which in raw units is 1.79 prior rest, five minus 1.79 gives me a value of 3.21. And you see it down there in that bottom sentence. That gives me the lower end of this range. And to figure out the upper end of that range, I start with the mean once again, and I take the mean plus one standard deviation. So I take the mean, which was five, plus one standard deviation, which is 1.79 prior rest. So five plus 1.79, and I get that 6.79 that I also see down there in that sentence. Once I have the upper or the lower and upper uh, values of that range, I can then make a statement that looks similar to what we see at the bottom of this slide, which says approximately two thirds of individuals have between 3.21 and 6.79 prior arrest. Boom. Now I've given the audience an idea of not just what the standard deviation is, but I've also applied it back and connected it with my mean. So by giving that information 3.21 to 6.79, I'm giving my audience an information about where the values were centered with the mean, as well as how spread out they were on average or typically. Um, so I'm giving a lot more information. Now, the final thing I'll, I'll say on this before I jump to the final slide is you're going, well, wait a minute, there's no such thing as 1.79 arrest or 3.21 arrest or 6.79. That doesn't make sense. I get it and I understand that. But for the sake of this class, specificity of numbers is crucial. So for a statistics class, we're going to keep those decimal points there. We're not going to round to whole numbers. And I've stressed that before, right? If our answers come out in decimal points, we keep them there. Now, if I'm, once I've computed my statistics and I've got them done, if I'm putting together a presentation for, you know, a city council or for, you know, a local police department or something like that, then, and the people in the audience may not necessarily have a lot of statistical background, I'm probably not gonna say between 3.21 and 6.79 arrests because they're gonna look at me crooked. Like, what are you talking about? So in that case, to that audience, I might say, oh, approximately two thirds of individuals have between, you know, at the low range, about three, and the upper range, just a little bit less than seven, right? Um, but you can see even there, I had to kind of become wishy-washy and less exact with how I explained it. Um, and so that's why, at least for this class, we are the math people. We are going to stick to the numbers as we see them. 
Okay, so that's it. So let's move on to our final slide, which is just one more example that you can work through using variable Z. So on this slide, this is just an extra example. I took variable Z, which remember was very similar to variable X, except for we had one outlier. We had that K6 now has a value of 28 prior arrests instead of what we saw with variable X. And then here, if you want to practice it, you can go through and look at how we did the exact same approach. Um, we calculated the mean, which was nine. We saw that from our previous lecture. We computed the deviation from each mean. We squared each deviation from each mean. We summed up the, squ the square deviations to give us our sum of squares. And notice, even that one outlier of 28, look how huge or how much, how much more inflated the sums of square is compared to the last slide. Remember on the last slide for variable X, the sum of squares was only 16. By incorporating one outlier, all of a sudden it's ballooned up to 448. So you can see how outliers can have a big impact on our statistics. And it's also why in our next lecture, when we start to talk about the shape of the distribution, we want to make sure that we sort of scrutinize and analyze the presence of those outliers because of the information or the influence they can have on other statistics. And then you can see here, as I walk through it, we get down to a standard deviation of 9.47. Once again, quite a bit larger um, standard deviation simply with the introduction of one outlier. All right, so I'll leave it at there um, for this particular lecture. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed it and made sense to you. Look forward to our next lecture where we will go into the third category of describing sample data, and that is looking at shape and distribution. So take care.